everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at OnLife. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Please join us after the webinar for a guided meditation session with Casey. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Avia, Amanda Damano. Hi everyone and welcome all of our attendees. Happy Thursday to you all. I am Amanda Damano, a Vice President at Avia. Avia is the nation's leader in digital um, and partner with digital transformation for healthcare systems. I'm gonna serve as moderator, but I'm joined by a fantastic panel doing great work um, in the intersection of behavioral health and social determinants. I invite them now to turn on their cameras and join me in the discussion. Uh, and also second the uh, opening here, we are um, going to have about a 45 minute moderated discussion followed by 15 minutes of your questions. So please ask early and often, and we'll be monitoring that chat in the Q&A uh, to make sure that this conversation goes where most helpful for you. Uh, ladies, I'd love for you to uh, just dive right in and start with your introductions. But as a means to getting in the content, I'd also love to understand your definition of behavioral health. Dr. Thomas, can I start with you? Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I'm Joanna Thomas. I'm a family physician, VP clinical strategy and population health at Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield have responsibility for case management, all lines of business. And I am uh, the, the lead clinician in our relationship with New Directions Behavioral Health. Awesome, thank you. And Shana? Great, it's great to be here with everybody. I'm Shana Hoffman, the CEO here at New Directions. Um, we are a behavioral health company that partners with health plans to support their behavioral health needs across their full population. We do that through identification of members that need access to behavioral health services, both self-identifying uh, and not identified that we believe will benefit, uh, connecting those members to care across multiple channels, and then uh, measuring those outcomes so we can kind of create that virtuous cycle for delivering be better behavior health outcomes. So delighted to be here today. Thank you. And Catherine. Here on mute, Catherine. Somebody had to do it. It's okay. <laughs> hey, there we go. are we there now? <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I'm on my phone, so I have to unmute two places. So I'm um, Catherine Bass. I'm the Senior Director of Informatics and Innovation at On Life Health. On Life Health is a total population health management company. We started off as wellness. We've got core functionality there, but we've really grown over the years to be a more comprehensive uh, solution offering and focusing on consumer engagement. And as, as Shana was saying, getting people to the right uh, options and services, you know, for what they what they need in their life. All right, um, you all took a pass. So I'm going to go back around on the definition of behavioral health. Um, <laughs> so, Catherine, I'll start with you since you're off mute. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I followed the lead of the others and forgot to talk about that. So, um, you know, when we think about behavioral health, we're really, we focus mostly on lifestyle and pre chronic disease kind of management. So, we really think about it in that lifestyle kind of capacity. You know, when you're going to get into the things that Shane is going to talk about, it's much more, you know, along the care continuum, more of the severe. A thing. So we're really focusing on sort of that mental emotional health and ways in which you can have tools in your toolkit to really help with that. And then, like I was saying, also, as we identify um, and exchange data back and forth with vendors like New Directions, we can, you know, kind of usher people to the right solutions. So we're really focusing on it from that mental and emotional kind of perspective. Thank you. Dr. Thomas? Yeah. What would you add? Yeah, thank you. Well, for me, as a family physician, you know, behavior drives everything behavior and behavioral health, it has a component in medical health, mental health, well-being, mind, body, spirit. And behaviors are also, behavioral health are so important when you think about treatment, recovery, prevention, and support. All of those domains of the care continuum need behaviors and are predicated by behavioral health strategies. 
Absolutely. Shana. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think uh, Dr. Thomas and Catherine covered it well, but I think for us, and I thought uh, Dr. Thomas would, would use this line, right? We think there is no physical health without mental health, and you really, you know, can't de-link the, the mind and the body. And I think that's, you know, we'll talk about this through the course of the discussion today, but it really is getting to that um, full internalization of that really as a country, um, that those two things kind of can't be de-linked in the same way we would talk about cardiac health or pulmonary health. We can talk about behavioral health as a area, but that ultimately sort of you have to think about that as the whole person. Um, and so, so that's, that's the only thing I would, you know, sort of add in, in our view on the world and how we do work with our health plan partners to kind of integrate those, the medical and phys and the behavioral health pieces. Yeah. Uh, just to round out introductions, um, I mentioned I work for Avia, but I also lead our center for care transformation and we're helping um, address and uh, um, bring focus to the digital opportunities for health systems to affect population health, health equity and specialty care. And in all of our frameworks, the digital opportunities address all three, the bio, the cycle and the social framework. And you cannot drive outcomes and improvement without all three. So Shana, where do you see the intersection really of social determinants and behavioral health showing up in the work you do? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, they really have this bi-directional sort of linkage between the two where there are underpinnings of sort of social determinants that drive behavioral health. Um, and then there's behavioral health um, needs uh, and conditions, right, that drive social determinants. And so you can think about scenarios where because of those underlying drivers from a social determinants perspective, whether it's economic status, whether it's, you know, access to food security, whether it's ability to get to pay for medications, right, that those things can actually drive behavioral health conditions of anxiety, depression, kind of concerns of that nature, and even in some cases, substance use and things like that. And then on the other side, there are behavioral health conditions, which can drive to some of those social determinants right, where because of certain inability to get treatment for certain conditions or inability um, to, be, to be taken care of in some ways that those can drive those social determinants. So for us, we really see them as sort of inextricably linked and drivers for one another. Um, and that's why it's important for us in the work we're doing to make sure we're accounting for both those pieces. Yeah, Dr. Thomas, did you have something to add there? Well, for us, Arkansas Blue Cross, you know, we learned pretty early on in the development of our programs um, that social determinants, you ignore them at your peril, you know, really when you're de dealing with so much. And it's foundational to our care management programs is having the information around social determinants of health at the fingertips of our case management staff. Um, you know, it really, they've really only got half of the history of a patient's condition without the context of the environment, the home, um, what's going on in the neighborhood and things like that. And we have a team of social workers who are working, not just in Arkansas, in all 50 states. And we've been sure to equip them with information around social determinants of health so that they're able to help our members with those barriers. And then always at our elbow is new directions and that behavioral health component and how the two, Ashana, very eloquently enunciated are driving each other backwards and forwards. Yeah. Um, Catherine, you know, based on your data perspective, you know, what are the most common barriers or challenges um, or most impactful on uh, social determinants on behavioral health? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, from a data perspective, there's um, some challenges that come to mind for me. There's a temporal aspect to part of this. So when we look at social determinants of health data, we're getting that in a couple of different ways. One of the primary, or really two of the primary sources for us, I would lump it under the umbrella of publicly available data. So that's why I said one source, there's two kind of sources are coming in that. You have the U.S. Census data, and you've got data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the BRFSS. Those are the two largest surveys that we do in the nation, and there's all kinds of data elements that are collected in that. And so um, a lot of those are focused on social determinants of health, particularly as they're geographically located. And so there's a temporal aspect there in indicating that um, you know, there's a timeliness factor of how often that data is updated. So you can have some data that may in some cases be stale. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge. The other thing that comes into that, into play as far as challenges, well, a couple of things. So one thing is that 
with the data, um, every the way it's collected is typically in a census tract area, which is a small geographical area. It's about the same size as a zip code, although they don't line up one to one. And sometimes it's at the county level, which is of course um, a less lower granularity than, I mean, a uh, higher granularity than the census tract. So part of the issue there is that everybody who lives in the same census tract, or even worse, everybody who lives in the same county would be tagged with the same kind of vulnerabilities. So in order to really know if that vulnerability affects somebody, you also have to have member reported data. You know, and so that's it, it's a challenge to make sure you have the comprehensive picture. So you have to make some efforts to ensure that you've got some individually collected data. You know, maybe through a health assessment. That's something that we do. Um, to marry with your social determinants of health data that you get from those public sources so that you really have a true picture. You know, I'm somebody who would be um, flagged as, as a, having a transportation barrier because of where I live. I'm, I'm outside of the, the metro area in Nashville. And we don't have great public transportation here. I've been very fortunate to have a job. I can afford to you know, have a car, maintenance, put gas in it. So I don't actually have a, a vulnerability in transportation, but you wouldn't know that until I have provided that additional context. So that's a pretty big um, barrier. I think the other thing that typically comes to mind for me, and I think about this when we are taking data, evaluating it, analyzing it, and then thinking about solutions and how we put that in front of somebody, this information can feel a little bit sensitive, social terms of health information, especially if you do not have the marriage of the personally reported data with the publicly available data. So we are very purposeful about how we present things to people to make sure that it feels um, relevant to them, but not judgy or inflammatory in any way. You know, we work with a behavioral economics team to make sure we have got that wording, you know, really sort of spot on. So several things kind of come to mind, but there's certainly ways uh, to get around those things. Yeah. And you're taking me right up into, I like to think about things pretty literally. So like if we were to think about, um, this topic on a, on a continuum of needing to screen and identify patients uh, with social determinant needs or behavioral health needs, making interventions, and then moving on to measuring the outcomes and adjusting. Um, mm -hmm. Shana, you know, what does effective screening or identification look like for you? Yeah, so you know, when we think about screening, I think you really need to take sort of a multi-channel approach to it. I mean, there's all these studies that the folks have seen, right? 60% of primary care visits have a behavioral health component that's part of them, right? Then we have people kind of out in the community that are using whatever kind of health apps that they're using. Then they're presenting in other specialty channels. And so to me, a component of assessment is sort of having a multi-channel approach. And again, thinking it more about it more like we would take blood pressure and weight, you know, at any visit you're going to and kind of thinking about behavioral health in that same context where you're getting a checkpoint because there also is kind of a element of where that can change over time, right? Something might change in someone's um, life. Certainly the pandemic obviously has impacted, you know, behavioral health very dramatically. Um, and so you sort of need that multi-channel approach, sort of that frequency of screening. Um, and then there's a component of, you know, what are the tools that are being used? There's a lot of measurement-based care that's kind of starting to infuse itself. I think it's not widely adopted at scale just yet. There's a lot of opportunity in behavioral health um, for that. And so it's what are those tools and what's the repeatable mechanism so that you can sort of track and trend how someone's doing. Um, those would be some of the, the areas of, I would, you know, highlight from a, of a screening perspective. And are you seeing like variation in the screening methodologies, like the actual questions that are used, or have you kind of centered into some that uh, really work for your um, patient population? Yeah, there's a pretty good library of sort of available tools that will lead to you getting a pretty good picture of someone and then you can layer in different components if you're trying to screen for, you know, substance use disorder or if you're looking at autism or you're looking at condition specific. So there's a pretty good foundational evidence. And I think there's some really cool technology companies that are users using some of that data today to fingerprint um, and figure out then actually what's the right intervention. Because I think there's this whole sort of trend of different acuity levels and we'll touch on access, but wanting to make sure that we're also, you know, driving people to a variety of different um, treatment avenues. Um, so I would say that there's really good foundational work um, from that assessment and screening where that's less the barrier at this point. Um, and it's more about sort of readily adopting and then being able to do it in a repeatable way and then having that data sit with enough organizations that are using it together to get that view of that patient. Yeah, the like community connectedness of this across all of the silos of people who interact with the patient is so important. 
um, Dr. Thomas, you know, Catherine touched on a little bit, but there's a, there's a lot of sensitivity associated with collecting this data. How do you make members um, or patients in your past life um, more comfortable with uh, letting us screen and understand their social and behavioral health needs? Well, for us in our program, it really all starts with our staff and that human contact that they make in their outreach to the members. Um, we know that they have to um, approach the members sensitively. Um, we have a whole education curriculum training them in uh, motivational interviewing, empathy. The staff understand health, health literacy and self-efficacy barriers. And we, we have um, dealing with 29 different languages. So you can just imagine the cultural um, awareness that the staff have to have so in training the staff with this sensitivity and empathy, and at the same time, engaging the members, meeting the members where they're at, so that the members have confidence that the case manager, the social worker at Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield has their back. The journeys, the healthcare journeys the members are on are incredibly complicated and um, they need a lot of help. And once they have the trust of our case managers, the confidence is there that that person is acting in their best interest is how yeah. we dispel those fears. Yeah. Yeah, if I can also just comment on that briefly. I mean, I think there's also just differences depending on what we're trying to affect as change. And I think we talk about it a lot of sort of under, you know, utilized um, members that might benefit from services who are not currently utilizing. And I think within that there's different categories and different levels of sensitivity, certainly um, that we need to look at and use different tools of how are we doing something really light touch where they may be just being fed, you know, some information and, and kind of opting in. Okay, it's among a bunch of different modules here that they can click on. I think there's other places where you can enter earlier on in that care delivery cycle. So for example, if someone's newly diagnosed with a chronic disease, it's kind of a very difficult time. You're learning all these new things. Okay, maybe there's a med that's associated with what you need to do. Maybe there's a lifestyle change, right? Maybe now you're thinking about your mortality. And I think being able to offer up side by side a behavioral health consult or a visit, you know, for a session, to me, that's a, a much easier point of entry where it's very much paired up in a moment of need that's not at all seen as invasive, but more wow, I'm confronting, you know, heart disease or diabetes. And I think we just forget sometimes because these are such prevalent conditions, the amount of, of lifestyle change when you're given that diagnosis, it's sort of, okay, well, X percent of the population has this, but for that individual, you know, it's very much so a, a lifestyle change. And so I think we have to also think about all the different places where this comes in. And I think a lot of times it's, you know, under treated substance use. And certainly that's a much more sensitive area. And we need to figure out much more nuanced ways of getting to people who may not be wanting to opt in or, or there's barriers or reasons for not seeking treatment. So I think there's also just a lot of nuance in how we think about the, the sort of all the condition states, if you will, in, in behavioral health. Yeah, this is like truly hyper-personalized care that requires a human touch and uh, creative intervention. Um, I'm gonna call an audible here because we have some questions already and they're associated with screening. So before we move off of the topic, I'd love to throw these to the group. Um, are we seeing the health assessment evolve to incorporate different types of questions to address behavioral health? So I assume these are the you know, annual health assessments. Um, how are they evolving to make sure we're screening for behavioral health? I'll take a stab at that one first. Um, so yes, it absolutely is evolving to be more inclusive of behavioral health. And you know, we're we're walking the line of having enough questions in there to gather the information we need to either assess that someone is like cool with the kind of things that we can provide, or if we need something that's a little bit more high touch and we send those over to like a new directions, for example, and also not making the, the health assessment super long, you know, so that's always the balance we're trying to strike, but there is definitely an evolution in that regard. There's also an evolution in the health assessment to include those social determinants of health elements. We've added it into our health assessment. I, I think other people are adding it into theirs because the reality is that we are all um, getting behind the fact that if you truly wanna have a meaningful impact on a person's life, 
that can't be done in a tiny silo of either wellness, traditional primary care, mm -hmm. a silo of behavioral care. Like it has to be an integrated kind of um, initiative. And it also has to keep in mind what's going on in that person's environment, you know, because those are all kinds of factors that are contributing to our ability or likelihood to make those decisions that we know lead to our favorable behaviors related to health and wellness and those kinds of things. So that evolution is 100% there and we are already working on some of those things. We're working actually with a lot of Shana's team on direction about which questions to add and kind of what is the best way to get the most information out of that with a handful of questions. So yeah, definitely, definitely seeing that. Uh, and the same here at Arkansas Blue Cross, all of our case management screenings are, um, and assessments have inbuilt um, behavioral health screenings and then triggers over for referrals over to new directions. And you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association had a big um, Health of America effort. And one of the things that it highlighted was how anxiety and depression are big problems with the millennial population. And from this, we really doubled down with our maternity population screening um, for depression, not just in the postpartum, but in the antepartum period as well. We know also when um, members suffer cancer, terrible uh, levels of um, behavioral health and mental health problems, a lot of which are not being met um, in terms of what we see from claims from behavioral health out in the community. We've got a whole program where we've developed with new directions around people suffering with uh, mental health and behavioral health who have a cancer diagnosis as well. Absolutely. Integration of the service <clears throat> being so important to any specialty care. Um, a couple of really practical questions, uh, some on the specific assessments or measures. Uh, so uh, are there any great tools that work to really uncover social, uh, social determinants of health? And are there any other um, well-accepted, validated um, uh, uh, tools beyond the PHQ-9 and GD 7 um, to assess and screen appropriately? I, I'll speak to this one a little bit, although it may be more in shame as well, health on those behavioral health things. Um, on the social determinants of health, you know, the, the primary source of that data is that publicly available data from the census and the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. The other great sources there, and there are some standard question sets out there. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head. I should have come prepared for that, but I can follow up um, with a response afterwards. But there are standard question sets out there, and that was what we used to kind of pull into our health assessment. Um, but the other thing to do is that person-to-person -person kind of interaction, and I think actually Dr. Thomas might have mentioned that at the beginning, because there's all kinds of initiatives typically around behavioral health and social determinants of health, and a lot of that starts kind of in the home. There's a lot of in-home care. Of course, this is all kind of pre-COVID, although I think we're kind of transitioning back there and can also be done to some extent through those virtual visits. But when you've actually got somebody in the home, a social worker, a care worker, they can they can assess right there, you know, what's going on. They can see that there's food in the cabinets or if there are utilities that have been turned off and a variety of other things that they can assess and kind of jot down. That's another place that we're getting some individual level data in addition to the uh, what I mentioned already is asking for it on a health assessment. We have another company that we partner with um, and it's a sister company of ours that actually has that in-home care and is gathering that. Information, so we're able to take that in as well and pair that with the other information we have. So that's what I would say about the SDOH stuff. I would maybe defer over to, to Shane on some of the better uh, behavioral health assessments. Yeah, I'll give my thoughts and then um, open to, to Dr. Thomas. I mean, ultimately, we are primarily using PHQ-9 and GAD-7, and part of that is because when we think about our outcomes so that we drive kind of in our care solutions or care management programs, we're measuring improvements against those. And so I think it actually is important to have some purity in terms of what's happening on that front end. I think the other area that's really going to um, sort of evolve over time is more thinking about what is the right mechanism to figure out the right intervention for someone, sort of right care, right place, right time, and figuring out, you know, what modality is going to be a good fit for this type of population. Is a hybrid virtual sud, um, su substance use disorder um, facility in combination with a face-to-face -face provider and some of these newer uh, sort of entrants to the market going to be a good fit? And helping to do some of that matching 
um, to say, okay, not all things are created equal. And again, there's a lot of personalization and sort of underlying preferences that go into these pieces. So I would say on the clinical assessments, it's pretty well baked. And that's what I was referencing earlier where there is you know, good um, data and that's essentially what's being used across the board. And I think the next sort of you know, frontier, and I think there are players out there that are already working toward this is really how am I matching that person to the right modality and sort of type of service that's going to work well for them based on a variety of things. I think social determinants can be a component of that, right, where virtual sort of can equalize in some cases, assuming that that's, um, you know, something that they're, they're comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, last really practical question. There's some great ones out here in the Q&A, but um, uh, the topic of like where and the burden on the primary care provider, is that the place? Is that the only place where you're collecting and screening? What are the other tactics and, and um, opportunities are you using um, to actually screen? Yeah, I'll just comment briefly on that. I mean, so, you know, I think when you have eyes on a patient is sort of one of the best times. So that's why, you know, reference that channel. I mean, we do screen every time someone calls into us for a referral. I actually just would argue it's the highest activation energy that's been overcome when somebody's picking up the phone to call us. Um, so that's where I think we have really a requirement to connect them to care. Um, and then I think that's part of what we're partnering with on life is seeing whether as part of that natural course of someone working through their wellness tools that they're being afforded from their employer, from their, um, you know, insurance carrier that they, can, based on some of those screening things can then be offered up some of those tools. So we're trying to figure out a sort of multi-channel approach to that. And then you have to also reconcile across, okay, did that person present in one of those settings and looked like they had something going on and how was that being addressed depending on where it's being um, screened. And, and I would say we, we had some interesting you know, discussions too of a discomfort with screening because what if I do screen someone for substance use and I know that there are not good provider options in the community and so I don't actually want that um, burden on me necessarily and I mean so that's that's a really interesting dynamic where we're trying to also support that but I don't I think we have to recognize you know for primary care to the extent that they don't have tools at their disposal and this is a lot of the work that's obviously going on with primary care integration it's you know, it, it's difficult when you then identify that and you're not either equipped, don't have the time to treat that or don't know what are the options available for that person. Yeah, um, we'll probably come back to that one. I'm really excited about um, the publicly available data sources and new uses of data to help ease some of the screening and identification burdens on providers. Uh, but let's move on to interventions. Um, Dr. Thomas, like, how do you use what you know about someone to really change the way that we're delivering the care? Well, when I think about what we're doing case management, whether that's with nurses or with social workers, I mean, it's really about meeting the member with using the information that we have at our fingertips. And we've got timely information. We just had a huge system upgrade that we have claims data on a daily basis updated. That's really powerful because when you're able to have a conversation with a member about something that you know is going on where they need help, that's where you get the buy-in. So the timeliness of the information is just critical. And um, the empathy that the um, case managers show is critical in the engagement. Um, you know, the members are on extremely complex uh, healthcare journeys, whether it's a, a, a mental health journey and we're working with new directions or it's a complex medical illness. There are often many different silos of information that we've had to bring together so that we have all this timely information at our fingertips. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Okay. Um, Sheena, you already kind of talked about this, but um, access, you know, there is such limitation to the availability of clinicians, especially in the behavioral health space. You know, even, you know, assessing some of the um, community resources for social needs, but focusing on behavioral health and specifically, you know, um, how do you, how do you address this when the clinical supply is so low? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things to unpack when we think about sort of behavioral health access challenges. Um, and I think some of that is the nature of sort of the, the workforce mm-hmm. dynamic and, and who has, you know, accepted insurance, who doesn't accept insurance, what are those rates look like, right? And so what what is that true availability look like if there's any of those kind of pieces that have you know, gone one direction or another, right? And so I think there's been a lot of dynamics that have led to, you know, both shortages, but also sort of supply demand mismatches. And so I think there's actually a lot of work. And I think in some ways, virtual equalizes some of this because there's less of that, you know, we've we've always looked historically at geo access needs, right? Do I have enough sort of coverage in the area around a particular member's need? And part of that excludes in a lot of cases, you know, providers that don't accept insurance, which is very much a, a challenge in the behavioral health industry industry. And so, you know, I think one, a virtual can sort of equalize because there's this supply demand um, matching that can happen that doesn't have to be as much geographically linked. But I also think there's a lot of newer models that are coming into play um, with regards to, you know, aggregating up some of that supply that sits out there that perhaps doesn't accept insurance today and sort of bringing that to bear for the market. Um, it, you know, and then also um, really, I think payers are, are understanding the value and importance of behavioral health and looking, you know, at the, the rates, right? And which has historically, you know, been something um, that that has been, you know, challenging and part of why there are those deltas between people that accept insurance and don't, right? And so I think there's a lot of factors that are kind of coming into play. And so I think it's a more nuanced um, discussion about supply demand matching in addition to, you know, some of those shortages. Um, and you, And it's, you have to sort of solve it creatively. You know, we think about it as sort of a stacked network strategy approach where we're bringing together, you know, face-to-face providers plus virtual plus these specialty, you know, newer provider types who can come into these markets and help with some of those pieces. And then, you know, thinking about the aggregator model. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of kind of components. I'm just, I think we can't sort of throw our hands up and say, hey, there's not enough supply. So we're sort of okay with whoever is getting the access you know, that's enough, right? We know that's not both in terms of people that have self-identified needs getting connected to care, and then even more so all of the untapped um, sort of demand out there where we know those people will benefit. So it's something we spend a ton of time in our organization sort of talking about um, and really trying to think from a problem solving approach to, okay, yes, there's these there's data out there that says these things, but how do we really think, how do we look at our network? How do we ID where that supply is, get that matched up to the demand and sort of use almost that engineering approach to it um, to, to try to creatively solution. Yeah, and this is where the power of digital is really starting to expand right. the, what's possible across the spectrum. You know, if, if I can just pivot off what Shanna said, one of the things, you know, we've all seen is this huge uptake in a virtual, Uh, care delivered through COVID and adoption by providers, not just for medical, but behavioral conditions as well. One of the intriguing things that we've seen when we've mapped it is in those socially vulnerable areas that have a high social vulnerability index, this is CDC data that we imported. So it's national data. We haven't seen the same uptake. So there's tremendous challenges still that we're going to have to address on how we get the uptake in those uh, members with these social vulnerability um, and SDOH challenges. Yeah. Hey, Amanda, I wanted to jump in on one thing too. I didn't come off mute (laughs) quickly enough when you said, you know, do you have anything to add to what Dr. Thomas's response was when you were asking about, um, let me look at what it was about how they changed the delivery of care if you know something about somebody. And there was also a question in the Q&A that I could kind of maybe lump some of these things together. Somebody asked about how you are purposeful, I'm paraphrasing, how you're purposeful about making sure care is available um, in underserved and minority communities. And I think yeah, one of the things that we find so valuable, and of course, a little biased, I'm coming from the data aspect on this, but one of the things that's so valuable about letting data drive your strategy is really being able able to understand, and this goes along the lines to some extent with what Shana was saying as well about supply and demand, really understanding where there is less access, but lots of need. I think that's a big way um, of understanding how you reallocate your resources. And then also understanding where you need to focus in on some of those underserved communities. The data can speak to that very clearly. We have, um, actually, Dr. Thomas just mentioned the Social Determinant Health Vulnerability Index the CDC has. We actually have our community-based index that is based off of the the CDC's um, 
index measurements, and we've created our own version of that so that we can look across a state or whatever region is appropriate and see according to the overall index, but also individual measures, which I think is really helpful. So you can begin to look like across the state of Tennessee, for example, where there will be census tracts that maybe have a high immigrant population, low percentage of people speaking English, different other different demographic factors, as well as socioeconomic and built environment, all different kinds of things. And so when you can filter down to those specific metrics, it really can help support a strategy and how you roll those things out and where you're placing your efforts. And I think that's a big part of understanding who somebody is and therefore what how you deliver care to them and also ensuring that you are lining up your resources in the areas that really need it and make sure you're being purposeful about addressing those populations that are underserved. So I just wanted to combine those answers. Thank you. And I'll keep it with you uh, while you're still off mute. Um, you know, where are you seeing the most exciting opportunities for digital disruption? Mm. Well, the good news, <laughs> silver lining for the pandemic, that that has um, certainly accelerated all of the digital disruption, things that I think were, were going to be happening anyway, you know, like the, the huge uptake in, in virtual care. I was talking to somebody a couple of months ago, and, and they I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were saying, you know, so something along the lines of like, you know, 5% of the population was taking advantage of virtual care options pre-pandemic, and it was something like 75%. I mean, it was this huge and, you know, enormous uptake in virtual care opportunities. And so, I mean, that's clearly a, a huge one. And Shana also referenced this when she was talking a few minutes ago that the virtual options, the digital delivery of care, in some cases, particularly around sensitive topics, I hate that there's still a stigma around you know, mental health, and I think we're getting better, but it still does exist to some extent. But the digital offering there, even around social determinants of health, and you can offer things and kind of assess where people are, um, having that, um, I don't know, kind of barrier, you're not going into an office that's for behavioral health, you know, that can be a little bit more comforting, a little more uh, comfortable for the person to get that care. And so I think that that's a big disruption there. I think the other thing that has come about and is, is all the rage right now, certainly the way we're attacking this, is really seeing our opportunity with the digital uh, care delivery model to really understand that person, what the right care is for them, and then you're integrating with the right kind of niche providers to say, hey, if you need this sort of persistent support that is kind of lifestyle behavior kind of things, we can do that for you. But we also know that if you need this higher touch care or if you need a specific resource related to food security or a subsidized ride share, you know, program that your, your health plan is offering, we can direct you to those things as well. So having that in a digital uh, format allows you to do all that kind of intelligent steering in a way that feels really comfortable and accessible for a very large, you know, percentage of the population. You know, I think one of the most exciting opportunities for disruption in, in the digital social determinant behavioral intersection is around virtual substance use disorder. It's a national problem. It's a chronic disease. It's everywhere. And we know that people for myriad of reasons are not getting treatment and the, the sad consequences of the, the death. Um, We've been working with New Directions on coming up with solutions in that space because people don't want to take off work. Um, a virtual solution is able to meet them where they're at. Um, we know that you know there may be marvelous places where people can go for a month and kind of disconnect and get go off the grid and clean up or whatever. That that. Um, kind of stereotype of what people think that the way the conditions handled, but they still have to come back to their home environment. They still have to interact with family, with friends, with work, with all of that. We, we believe there's opportunities with virtual solutions in that space. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything, Shana. I don't want to 
put you on the hot seat there, but. Yeah, no, actually the two things I was going to comment on are one, just from our data perspective, and I don't have the stats on this, but we've seen a lot of the newer, um, the uptake in virtual is members that actually weren't using care before from a behavioral health perspective. So it is sort of going to Catherine's point of there might have been stigma barriers or obviously just effects of the pandemic, um, but it is sort of interesting to look at. There's certainly been members that flipped over from face to face and are continuing on virtual with those providers, but we are seeing a lot of that new virtual is new members. And then the other other thing I was going to comment on from a digital disruption, I, I think virtual SUD, absolutely. And I think um, even just also the, you know, specialty provider types with a virtual component in behavioral health. And then, you know, what we're trying to really focus on is, again, doing that population identification and getting people driven or connected over to those uh, provider types are really sort of bringing the pieces together where if we know we have high concentrations of need with a, you know, large primary care provider with uh, one of our plans that we work with, how do we have that virtual and some of them are virtual hybrid face-to-face -face, sort of put them side by side so then you can drive those referral patterns, right? So it's it's sort of the solutions are there and then I think it's on us to put kind of the people process technology together because ultimately, you know, I that that is fundamentally, I think, what has to be brought to the table to get these solutions to work. Um, and that's why there is a very human element that I think you kind of heard come across from everyone. But, you know, we do have majority of our organizations, probably 500 or so clinicians, right, that are bringing that human element. Um, and so I think if you can bring that technology coupled with kind of that the people and process piece, that's what's going to you know, really start to drive um, the penetration rates in, in members that are in treatment, which are still very, very low from particularly from a substance use perspective. Yeah, we are, you know, really excited about some of the digital technologies that leverage proven and effective care models in crisis intervention, peer support, contingency management. They're there, but to your point, just kind of integrating that into your um, offering in a way that um, that works for the operations and also for the patients. Um, and these are not like predictions, like out of the pandemic, I know in, um, in the data across our network, you know, virtual health um, for behavioral health has two, three, five times adoption rates of other specialties. And so it's happening and, and certainly um, something that we think will sustain. And then um, back to addressing social needs amongst our network providers, um, the community resource referral platforms like an Aunt Bertha, Now Pow, Unite Us are like the number one adoption that our customers are talking about. And people are really getting serious about trying to make digital connections to those community resources, which is exciting. So we'll move on from, uh, we've been across screening interventions that we're making and now into measurement. It's so important that we're able to defend and, and understand the outcomes and adjust as we go. Catherine, you know, um, what is measured, what is the measured value or impact of interventions and where are you seeing impact and to what degree? Yeah, so I think, you know, you're thinking about the value story and of course that's derived from, from various measurements and metrics that you're tracking. That value story is going to differ depending on where you are. So when I think about our value story, a big part of that is certainly uh, achievement of clinical milestones. You know, if you're thinking about more physical health, um, but there are certainly those same kinds of things that can be achieved with behavioral health. There are going to be some things that like Shanna's team would measure that probably wouldn't be our measurements. So we would be looking at things around, um, you think about those tools in your toolkit for how to be resilient, handle stress, have uh, high levels of health literacy. We would be looking at tracking sort of a starting point, kind of where they are through conversations, intervention, coaching. The other big piece of value story for us, because we are kind of a cog in the wheel and having, again, that sort of persistent, supportive experience for members where they may shoot out to some um, additional resources or other kinds of solutions that are appropriate for them. The big value story that we can tell with our clients is we were able to identify what that person needed and the more we know about them, the better we can do that care, like you were mentioning earlier. You know, the more we have an understanding, a really comprehensive picture of that person, the better we can promote and deliver care to them that's appropriate. And then, then from the client side of things, it's about telling them, hey, we were not only able to identify that this was a need, we promoted a resource to them. They clicked on that resource and they actually went out. So let me just give an example here. If we identified somebody that needed that higher touch behavioral care need, and we were like, okay, look, this person needs to maybe go out to new directions. There's going to be appropriate care for them there. It would be about 
identifying that person, showing them a, a you know a tile that said, hey, you've got this program, clicking them out, ushering them over to New Directions, and then also having a two-way data share with New Directions so that we can know what milestones they're achieving, what are the metrics that are successful for them. And what I'm referring to that is that kind of closed loop attribution, be able to say, hey, we not only identified a need for somebody, we put the right resource for them in the right kind of, you know, engaging framework. They clicked on that, they are now working with new directions and they're doing, you know, X, Y, and Z kinds of things. So it's about being able to um, tell the story around what's important for you and tracking certain behaviors. And then also being able to tell the client what we're doing for their population, because it's all about putting the right thing in front of the right person at the right time, because we all need different things at different times. So really that closed loop attribution is the big piece of the value story that we're really focusing on right now. I'd love to add light to this in a personal story. Um, yeah. Joanna, I think you had like given us a, a story of when uh, a personal um, intervention was made, an intervention was made at a personal level and how it impacted. Do any of those stick in your mind to share with this audience? Yeah. Um, not long after I moved to Little Rock, the nurses and the social workers got me in the room. Dr. Thomas, this patient member has been in the ER 71 times. Could you believe it? 71 times in one year. The clinical story was she had Crohn's disease, pretty severe, had been discharged from the hospital with a line and was receiving TPN um, at night. But what kept happening was she kept getting nauseous and vomiting and being admitted to the ER and the hospital. We arranged referral to the med center. Expert GI uh, consult uh, got her hooked up with the primary care had peer-to-peer -peer conversations, group huddles and everything. And we just kept persisting and saying, something is going on here. We, we've got to get deeper. We've got to get deeper. It turns out the home situation was not safe. There was domestic uh, violence, intimate partner violence. And, you know, the most immediate response anyone has, they ask themselves, am I safe? This member was not safe at home and the only behavior she knew to exhibit to get to safety was to stop the TPN, stop the line. She became dehydrated. She became nauseous. She went to the ER. She was admitted to the hospital. She got to a safe place. Through the skill of the staff getting her to confide in them that this was the situation, they were able to help her get to a counselor be a behavioral health provider, get legal advice, get the self-efficacy and the strength to make the decisions to get to a situation where there wasn't that danger at home, which was leading to the behaviors that was leading to the clinical situation. I've always thought that was a beautiful story, how everything's connected. Absolutely. I think shares it so well. Shana, um, how do you really measure um, provider performance at scale on these topics? Yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time focusing on, you know, provider quality and performance and do we have historically done it, you know, a lot through site visits, assessments, kind of tools that we have in screening um, providers on certain things and then going out and, and facilitating discussion with them. I think there's been so much um, evolution in the measurement based care sort of space from an outcomes perspective on the behavioral health provider side. And actually, there's been a lot of companies that sort of grew up there and now are kind of thinking about how they're facilitating primary care um, integration and, and sort of that connection to care over to the behavioral health side. And so I think it's really exciting to see. I think for so long, there has been this perception that there's not good measures. It's really hard to do kind of outcomes based um, work in behavioral. And I I think that's being, you know, sort of slowly sh shattered, um, which is great. And I think you just have to break it out to think about the different you know, levels of care, different sort of conditions that are within behavioral, and then there are really good kind of measures and, and outcomes tools. Um, I think the interesting thing too, right, is 
um, because that hasn't been in play, you know, there is sometimes resistance, right, on the part of the uh, provider community. And I think, you know, I, we've, we've talked to some of the organizations that do some of this and they say, you know, um, the pri providers that are really high quality love it, right, because it shows that they're operating really well. Um, and then providers that are maybe more middle of the road um, or maybe not performing hate these types of tools. And so, um, and then from a payer perspective, obviously, we love these things because it sort of shows us how we should be thinking about network curation. And so, I think there's going to have to be, you know, a little bit of a sea change because right now, in some cases, there's not a requirement to adopt, right? And but there's increasingly been incentive, you know, payments being put in place or different kind of mechanisms that are being used um, to ensure that that's going to be sort of at scale um, being used. And I think it's really important. And there's, you know, particularly in certain areas when we think about substance use, because there is a very wide variety um, of performance kind of when we look at, you know, across our, our network in terms of the, the outcomes and quality. Um, and so, you know, I think there's so much exciting activity happening in this space and still so much work to do, but I think it's really an opportunity area. Dr. Thomas, uh, we can't go a meeting without talking about the impacts of the pandemic. Um, so how has that really shifted the potential for impact? Um, you know, when I look into the future, I see um, tremendous need because of the, the loss, the devastation, the, uh, the suffering, um, families, um, and so there's tremendous opportunities there. And then kind of sparkling in the, there is this, all this disruption and this adoption of um, behavioral health, virtual visits, medical virtual, all, all kinds of um, disruptive solutions and um, abilities that we will be able to give to our members to help them manage their lives. And then, you know, it's the role that we're playing as a health plan in um, rolling out vaccinations and impacting that way, continually educating and reinforcing, um, you know, the needs around masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, all of these things um, we quickly had to work into our uh, staff conversations um, as the pandemic hit and then as it moved on. Does that make sense? It does. Um, there was a particular question about um, the pandemic demonstrated specific social behavior, such as mask wearing and social distancing. Um, it's been helpful for the virus just uh, spreading, but what kind of data and learning uh, has been produced by studying the population's reaction to these restrictions? Do we know yet like what the impact has had? Yeah, I saw that question come in. Um, I have not looked at that data specifically. I'm sure somebody is tracking something along those lines. I think there will be some interesting things that kind of come out of that, some insights, but I haven't looked at it yet. And so I can't kind of speak to it. I just want to address that it's out there. And I know that there's, there's going to be some sort of correlational things there, insights that I think are going to be helpful. I just haven't looked at it yet. So TBD. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that resonates in my mind as well is the impact on healthcare professionals after running this uh, long slog. We're already mm -hmm. seeing a lot of implications there, which are um, pretty scary. Um, Shana, uh, what needs to change? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, it really does go back to that there is no physical health without mental health. And I think, you know, there's so much work that's being done around stigma reduction. There's so many wonderful organizations in particular areas that are working tirelessly on that and really embedding that training into all sorts of places. I mean, I think there's there's so many more upstream places that training has to go into, right? Every sort of residency program, um, you know, needs to be training on, on mental health and that being so, you know, critically part of every interaction that's being had with a patient, right? So I think it's just the almost operationalization at scale of sort of the stigma reduction. I think there's really tangible ways that that sort of needs to still um, you know, manifest itself. Um, and so, you know, I think that's one area. I think the other piece is really around sort of widespread adoption of sort of measurement-based care um, and having a mechanism to measure, you know, outcomes and, um, and how things are working, both from a fit of, of provider um, engaging with 
with that member and making sure we have the right representation, you know, from a cultural and diversity perspective within our networks to meet those needs and from a clinical outcomes, but really sort of just using data in this field in a different way um, is our, you know, sort of two of the things I would highlight. There, there are so many things and we're, we're working uh, rapidly and tirelessly over here on a lot of the things that we want to see sort of changed. Um, but those would be two of the things that I would highlight. Anyone else want to jump in on that question? Pretty open-ended. What needs to change or what does the future look like? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what the future looks like. And um, and actually, I want to address another question that came in. They were asking about sort of the key issue is patient engagement when you're changing behavior. And how is that you know, taken into account when you're thinking about their culture, their values, their preferences of each individual? I love that question. And it, it tees me up for something that I think is is what's going on in the future. So, and it also kind of all comes back to the question you first posed, which is how does knowing more about a person change the way you're delivering care? And what I think that answer is, is I mean, generally speaking, it changes everything about the way you deliver care, whether it is what care you're delivering, what resource you're providing to them, the way in which they're getting it. Is that digital? Is it something that they need to be that person to person care in the, in the home when we're able to do that again? And you cannot do that and be specific in that hyper-personalized uh, treatment option for them if you do not know about them. And so when we think about the things that are coming up in the future and the things that kind of excite me about where we are is that we are in such a great place with having data accessible, having different kinds of data accessible. So, you know, when we, like when I first started this industry two decades ago, um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> So when I first started, you know, the things that we really had were basically the stuff that you got in the health assessment, really basic information about people's, and helpful information, don't let me, don't let me get you the wrong impression, basic and helpful information on their um, blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease history, uh, their current behaviors, are you exercising, smoking, taking efforts to manage your stress, which are all great, but they're a very kind of isolated piece of the puzzle and when you can take in all kinds of other information that gives you the opportunity to understand something about somebody's culture, their values, their mores, then you can create things, not only the content that you're creating for them, the resources that you're pointing them to, but you can take into account how is that presented, how is it framed, what's the language you're using, what are the things that you're offering or not offering because of those things that you understand about somebody. So it's a great place to be because there's so much data available. The challenge, of course, is, you know, getting that in an accessible form and being able to really do something with it because data is king unless you don't actually do anything with it and then it's not anything. So I think that's a great place to be. I think it's what the future looks like and it's how we will do that really individualized care is knowing more about that person. So that's, that's what's exciting for me about the future. Dr. Thomas, from a payer perspective, we have some questions about, um, you know, digital, the use of digital therapeutics and um, how are payers kind of looking at the opportunities there and potential reimbursement structures. By digital therapeutics, can you be a little bit more detailed? Yeah, I think it was brought up in the context of like substance use disorder. We were talking about contingency management or peer support. If providers were to offer tools like that, would we see, do we see payers being supportive of those kinds of efforts in the payment? And you think like providing math and things like that? Sure, yeah. Well, we're definitely looking at it and we've definitely been in uh, extensive conversations with new directions around that. Um, I think when you look at how that space, people 15, only 15 to 20 percent of people are even getting any treatment. Mortality is terrible, um, but it is an area where there is stigma that needs to be broken down. Um, yes, we're, we're definitely having conversations around that. Yeah. Three minutes left. I'll see what else I can knock off of this uh, very active question uh, chat. 
I would just say on the digital therapeutics front too, I mean, we're also working creatively with a lot of these newer entrants to think about the reimbursement structure and strategy, right? Because that's very much a component of it. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of openness and creativity going on from an early stage, you know, organization perspective. And I think um, there is, you know, movement on that front, particularly in behavioral health that's happening on the payer side that I think is, you know, yes, we want outcomes data, we want ROI data, but there's an openness to sort of recognize that, you know, if there's clinically available data on these pieces, then we can, you know, partner up and kind of try to get members into treatment with some of these mechanisms. I think we've seen this in some of the newer entrants for autism, um, kind of as, as um, counter offerings to, to ABA therapy purely, as well as in, the, in this SUD space. So that's just the other thing I would offer on the digital therapeutics front. Mm -hmm. Well, with our one minute left, I'll just go around the horn. Uh, what are you most excited about has like kind of happened in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months? Shana, you're off mute first, so I'll uh, pitch it to you. Yeah, I mean, I think just the conversation that's going on now, right? I mean, the, it, there was all this pent up um, interest and demand that was happening, frankly, before the pandemic talking about behavioral health. But I think this has really catalyzed um, sort of a moment in time for us to figure out both in service of people that are impacted by the pandemic from, you know, their mental health, from a mental health perspective, but also then for everybody else that already was, you know, struggling and underdiagnosed or sort of diagnosed couldn't get into care. And so I just think you're seeing so much creativity and, um, you know, sort of sea change going on sort of right before our eyes that uh, there's just, you know, incredible uh, energy um, it, that we're seeing across, you know, all of our payer uh, organizations, across all the people that come inbound to me and want to work with our organization, right? And so I just think it's, it's a really, um, it's a sort of transformational moment in time for behavioral health. I, I feel the same way. Um, as a family physician and someone who um, was working in the ER, in the hospital, you know, seeing the impact of behavioral health and social determinant on people, to see it recognized in the payer space and to see solutions at the fingertips of the staff so that the staff are able to impact um, members with this information, with this data, is pretty exciting. And Catherine. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, what's exciting for me is the expansion of the populations you're working with. I'm gonna sneak in and answer one more question about somebody asking about the 65 and older age group and Medicare Advantage. Part of the evolution that's happened in the last handful of years, last five years really probably, is a much deeper dive and effort on providing opportunities and resources to that Medicare Advantage population, that 65 and older group. There's a ton of information, especially as baby boomers are continuing to age in and just grow in that population enormously. A lot of resources have been put there. So I love to see that. Part of my background is public health driven. So the social determinants of health, behavioral health, really becoming a huge and significant part of the conversation and having significant, meaningful resources aimed at it is such a great place for us to be. There's so much data available to us to us to work with a broader population and to really do it in a way that's meaningful to them. So that is super exciting. And I appreciate everybody's attention today while we talked about this. Great, well, thank you so much. You made this role really easy and that uh, was a great discussion. I hope the audience enjoyed it as well. Stay tuned for meditation. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you to Amanda and all of our panelists. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now take a break from your day with a meditation session with Casey. Hi there, thank you so much for having me. And I so appreciate those of you who are able to stay for a fairly brief uh, 15 minute meditation. I, I will preface before we start, um, which if you've taken meditation with me before, you may have heard this analogy, but I think there is such a common misconception that if we are meditating correctly, we are not supposed to think about anything. Our mind is totally clear and we float away on a blissful cloud, right? And actually our mind is designed to think and it has a tendency to be very active, which can be a very good thing. Um, and especially when you're coming from a panel like this where so much stimulating, interesting conversation, um, it's quite common for our mind to wander when we meditate. So I just bring this up to say, 
please practice patience and compassion with yourself as you notice thoughts come and go. The practice of meditation is not necessarily about not thinking, but rather shifting the relationship that we have with our thoughts. So when we notice a to-do list that comes to our mind, or we think about something that happened yesterday, instead of riding off with those thoughts, I'll offer up this visualization for you. So if you can imagine, and then we'll get started. If you can imagine yourself standing on a sidewalk and watching two different lanes of traffic going by. Maybe sometimes there are a lot of cars, sometimes not so many cars, maybe one car comes by and honks and it's very loud, but you are standing on the sidewalk just noticing and watching what's happening. And this is really what we are doing in meditation. The cars represent our thoughts. Sometimes there will be a lot of them, sometimes they will be loud, but our job is to not be angry that the cars are there, but rather to stay on the metaphorical sidewalk and just be the observer, noticing them drive by. There was a thought, there was a thought, instead of jumping in the passenger seat of any specific thought and now driving off in a direction and we don't even know where we are anymore, right? So that is really the practice. And um, one really powerful way to stay connected to this present moment rather than the future or the past is through the vehicle of the breath. So within our meditation today, I will be doing some guided affirmations, some body scanning, and also a bit of breath work. If at any point the breath that I am counting doesn't feel like it's totally resonating, maybe it's a bit too long or too short for what feels comfortable, breathe at a pace that feels really good and supportive to you today. So this is all just an offering for you. So as you find your way into a comfortable seat, I encourage you to maybe shift around in your chair a bit, roll your shoulders up toward your ears as you breathe in and down your back as you breathe out and then maybe palms face down on your thighs. I invite you to close your eyes here almost as if by closing your eyes you are closing the curtain on all of the external stimulation and visualizations you've been taking in looking at your screen and signaling to your body that now it is time for your focus to go inward. And if closing your eyes is not resonating, you're more than welcome to gently gaze at the tip of your nose or something slightly out in front of you. And from here, I invite you to take a big open mouth exhale. <sighs> Smooth, long breath in, feel your belly and chest rise. Maybe hold your breath at the top and big sigh out. We'll do some elongated breathing in a bit, but for now, just allow your breath to flow in and out at whatever rhythmic pace feels the most natural. Not trying to control the breath, but bringing some awareness to its presence right now. And as you sit here, can you notice what does it feel like to bring a bit of a heavy sensation into your seat? So really noticing where your chair or the ground is holding you up. And can you allow your physical body to soften into that support, even if it's just 5%. Notice where your feet are touching the ground. And then draw your awareness all the way to the crown of your head. Again, noticing any thoughts, noticing what's taking your attention, but drawing your focus back to your breath and back to the very top of your head. Could you imagine you just grew two inches taller and maybe this allows your shoulders to move away from your ears ever so slightly. I invite you to visualize a color, any color of your choice. 
notice if our busy minds are trying to negotiate what the right color is or second guessing and you can change your mind but at some point trust your intuition and just pick one color see if you can notice the qualities of this color the texture of this color and if you're having a hard time really seeing this color, maybe visualize an object that this color is a part of. So something maybe whether it's in a fruit or a painting, a vegetable, something in your home, something that you know this color is a part of and you can visualize that if that is helpful. Visualize this color and for our purposes today, this color is representative of whatever you are energetically craving more of. So if you are craving a sense of calm, this color represents peace, calm, and relaxation. If you are craving a sense of trust, this color embodies that. If you're craving to feel more grounded or perhaps to feel more energized, craving a sense of confidence. Just take a moment to question, what is it that I would like to invite more of into my body, my mind right now? And imagining that this color represents that exact energetic quality, see if you can really visualize this glowing beaming color of yours pouring across the top of your head. See if you can really visualize it pouring down your face, starting to bring some relaxation into all of your facial muscles space between your upper and lower teeth so that your jaw relaxes, tongue rests at the bottom of your mouth. Visualize this color starting to move down your throat all the way toward your shoulders, pouring down your arms. Maybe you even physically feel relaxation taking place all the way to the tips of your fingertips. Visualize this color, especially vibrant and bright across your heart space, almost as if a beam of this light is pouring from your chest all the way out into the room around you. Can you visualize this color continuing to move down your back softening any muscles that are in need of a bit of support as this color moves all the way to your hips, down your thighs, toward your calves, all the way to your feet. Your entire body beaming and glowing with this light energy that is really representative of what you are choosing to bring more awareness to energetically, what you are choosing to cultivate more of energetic, energetically, whether that is peace, groundedness, support, trust, confidence, energy, compassion, whatever your specific intention Take a really deep breath in. Imagine you are breathing that color into your body. And take a big breath out. Can you visualize that color wrapping around you almost like a supportive blanket? And just for about one minute, I'm going to guide us through some breathing. And this breath will really stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system. And what this will do is signal to our body that we are safe, we are grounded, we are in a space where we can relax and receive. So maybe if it resonates with that color on your mind, exhale completely. 
Inhale on a count of four, three, two, one. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Inhale, four, three, two, one. Exhale, four, three, two, one, inhale, four, maybe visualizing the color for two, one, exhale, four, three, two, one, inhale, four, three, two, listen for the change. Hold your breath at the top for two, one, exhale, five, four, three, two, one, inhale, four, three, two, one, hold at the top for three, two, maybe on a hissing sound, exhale, three, two, one, inhale, four, slowing it down, three, to fill up to capacity, hold your breath for four, three, keep softening shoulders, two, any way you would like to exhale for five, four, three, two, one, take a deep breath in at whatever pace feels good to you and take a deep breath out. And just observe, notice if there is somewhere physically where you would like to send more nurturing, calming energy, imagine sending your breath and that color to whatever section of your body is asking for more support. And for the next few moments, Allow your breath to simply exist in whatever rhythmic pace feels so natural. Can you let your belly soften, seat heavy, feet planted, body so grounded? If it resonates, you might gently draw one hand to your belly, one hand to your heart making a connection and thanking yourself for setting aside the time. It might seem simple, but scientific studies have shown that breath work and meditation, we can actually, through these practices, change our brain. The amount of gray matter that shows up in different sections of our brain, our ability to strengthen our memory, all sorts of incredible things that can happen by taking time to practice presence and stillness. So thanking yourself for be here, being here. Take a deep breath in. Big breath out. And no rush at all. Just allow your eyes to gently blink open and reorient yourself into your space. You might not even look at the screen right away, but just notice the room you're in, maybe do some neck rolls, shoulder rolls, notice the colors in the room around you. And thank you so much for being here. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Again, my name is Casey Lane, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much.